celebrating the Asian Indy. In today's dynamic times for Indy cinema, where the scope is forever changing, growing, evolving, scope for promotion, for monetization, it is important to look back and celebrate the work of a world sales agent, which in a career spanning 20 years, steadfastly stood by its eclectic choices, truly value-added to the indie ecosystem by mentoring and reaching out some amazing films and filmmakers. Fortissimo. And the man who eventually spearheaded it, Michael Werner. Fortissimo in its run had nurtured the Asian art house and emerging talents in Europe and the Middle East. The company had also built up an enviable track record in featured documentaries with its factual catalogue, including Capturing the Freedmans, Food Inc., Super Size Me, and the Martin Scorsese directed Rolling Stones picture, Shine a Light. With his deep understanding of Chinese and Asian cinema, Werner had become a talking point in the 90s within film business circles when he released The Titanic in China to a record breaking box office. He carried on the Fortissimo tradition of choosing, acquiring, promoting, and cultivating business opportunities for indie films once he took over in 2009. Werner had a prior focus on big commercial films, handling such titles as Die Hard 3, Talk Radio, and Evita. As a media consultant, his clients included 20th Century Fox, International, IBM, Polygram, and the Sunshine Group, Cine Asia. So as we look back, to look forward at the indie cinema scape, the conversation with Michael Weiner aims to provide us insights as he shares his experiences and perspective from having worked and observed with Indian, Asian, and world cinema over the years. Bringing in a curator's perspective to the conversation will be Cameron Betty, artistic director of the Toronto International Film Festival, which has significant contribution in reaching out Asian content to the international market in the recent in and the past years. So here is welcoming you gentlemen. Please take the evening forward. Michael and Cameron, please. We are very privileged to have you here. have with us really one of the wisest people, I would say, in the global film industry, especially when it comes to Asian cinema. Uh, but you're an American. You were born in Los Angeles. You started your career at Summit. Uh, you worked in, in Hollywood for many years uh, before you started uh, your long career in Asia. What, what first drew you to Asia and to Asian film? Um. Let me just say one thing first, um, just to clarify one thing. Um, I wish that Titanic had been a fortissimo film, because uh, it was mentioned in that discussion, but unfortunately it was a, not unfortunately, it was a Fox film, and I was working for Fox at the time. But um, anyway, after that clarification. Um, what, what's my fascination with Asia? Um, it's quite interesting. I always make a joke, because um, it's kind of a funny joke. I, I was conceived in Asia, actually. My parents. My father, yeah, I, was, I was conceived in, in uh, Yakutsk, Japan. My father was in the Army Corps of Engineers. He was a geologist. And my mom came over to stay for about a year. And uh, I was made in Japan, but born in Los Angeles. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the early connection. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's the early connection. Um, I wanted to be, when I was, before I started working in the film industry, I, I wanted to be a diplomat. And I was always fascinated with Chinese studies. And so at UCLA, I studied um, Asian studies, in particular Chinese studies. I tried to master um, Mandarin Chinese, not, not very successfully. And um, ultimately, while I was in college, I started working at an independent film company called American International Pictures, AIP. And I, how I got that job is 
the, the classic old-fashioned way in Hollywood, and I think it also is the same in Bollywood. It's called nepotism. Um, <laughs> my best friend's uncle was a guy named Samuel Arkoff. Samuel, Samuel Arkoff owned AIP. He was the, the co-founder of that company. And I got a job in the mailroom, and uh, my friend, my best friend worked there also, and at some point he left to go to university in, in another place, and I took over his job. And he hadn't been there long enough, and so everybody at the company thought I was the nephew. And so I was really well treated, and, and, uh, and, and that's how I got involved with the film business, and I kind of at some point decided, mm, this is a different kind of diplomacy, I think I'll try to stick with the film business. And I didn't end up going to graduate school, I didn't end up becoming a diplomat, but I ended up becoming a person in the foreign sales business, and, and I think we did quite well with it. Do you remember what first drew you to Asian film? Was there a film that you saw when you were at AIP or at university? Um, not particularly. The, the films that AIP had were, were, were exploitation films. The only Asian film I remember that AIP had was a kung fu film called Golden Needles, where they got in trouble with the U.S. Postal Service because they, they put kung fu, these very um, sharp needles into a mailing and mail was out and they got in trouble with the Postal Service. <laughs> that was the promotion for the bill to put needles in the mail. Most, and I learned promotion is very important. And, and I think we're talking, tomorrow we have a session on, uh, on, on film promotion and getting ready for film festivals. But no, no particular uh, thing. I think it was an uh, opportunistic um, uh, opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about Fortissimo? Because it was an unusual company, still unique, I think, based in Amsterdam. Uh, with very strong roots in Hong Kong as well, and really bringing a lot of films from all across, uh, a lot of Asia, uh, into the West, selling those films at markets like Cannes and Berlin. Um, how did that company get started, and how did it, uh, how did it take on that very unique identity? So, first of all, we have to give credit to the original founders of the company, the late Dr. Berendrecht, who some of you know, who kind of knows very well. Um, and um, Helen Loveridge, uh, and, a, and a Hong Kong journalist who became a filmmaker named Shu Tei. They were the, those three were the original founders of Fortissimo. And they they came pretty much they came from a background of film festivals. Doctor worked at Rotterdam, and Helen I think worked in London. And Shu Tei was in the Hong Kong Film Festival. And, and they recognized that there were a number of films coming from Asia. That didn't get exploited, that didn't get released into the world. They, they sort of would be presented at film festivals, or, um, or filmmakers would try to get them presented at film festivals. And at that time, Asian cinema wasn't really in vogue. In and in what era are we talking about? This is the early 90s. Fortissimo yeah. started in 1991, actually. And I joined, um, in, I, I moved to Hong Kong in 19. 95, I was working for 20th Century Fox to deal with Fox, and I became a consultant to both Fox and Fortissimo. And that's how I got involved, and then eventually I, I bought out. Uh, one of the partners, Shu Kei, the Hong Kong partner, left, and later I bought out Helen, and then when Dr. passed away, I took over the company. You've worked with some of the great filmmakers uh, from uh, Asia, maybe the one that, that most people would know would be Wong Kar Wai, a Hong Kong filmmaker, real, a genius, a maverick, I'm sure sometimes frustrating, he's known to work for many months, sometimes years on, on films, but uh, really each one a masterpiece in its own way. Can you talk a little bit about working with an artist of his caliber, his stature, and, and what it means to kind of translate what he's doing for a global market? He, he's, um, in a way, he's a very easy, that part is complicated, you know, waiting for the film to get finished. But he's a, he's a, he's a very um, multifaceted filmmaker because he's also his own produ he, he's a producer, he has a producer mentality, he has a business mentality, and he has a great marketing sense. So he's already conceptualizing, when he starts to think about a film, and I remember going to his office with Alfred, he used to work like he would start working in the afternoon, so he'd go at two o'clock in the morning, and he'd be full steam, and you'd be dying. And um, but Did he always wear the sunglasses as well. Not not in the office when he knows people. Yeah, oh, I see. Okay. But when the strangers come, you know, he always many mostly wear sunglasses. Um, 
But you would go in and he'd be listening to music. He'd be, let's say like when he was conceptualizing Happy Together and he was listening to all kinds of, of, um, of salsa music and, and, and dance music, Spanish dance, uh, Argentinian dance music and, and um, samba from Brazil. And he was, so you could see that he worked with, tried to get the sense of what he wanted through music and then there'd be huge stacks of books on his desk that he had read where he was doing background research, and then thousands of pictures, and to be pretty meticulous about conceptualizing what it was that he eventually wanted to do, but, but when he shot the film, he'd shoot millions of feet of film, and then two or three years sometimes. Um, but somewhere in there, he, he, he had kind of planned in advance what where he wanted to go with it all. And, and, and so, as a distribution company, a distribution executive, you'd come in and he'd already be able to talk a little bit about who he thought the audience was or what he thought the marketing would be like or um, how he thought the film might go. It didn't always end up that way, but, but he, he, at least he had an awareness. Unlike many producers, unlike many filmmakers, he, he really had early, um, or an early sense about every film and where he, he wanted to do. He's That's very helpful if you're a distributor. I'm sure. Uh, He's one of those filmmakers, and there are several uh, throughout uh, many different Asian countries who've really become their own brands, who have distinct identities, and, and there's almost a kind of a Hong Kong style that he's very much associated with, the, the stylishness, the use of the crime genre, but kind of bringing kind of an art house gloss to it. In South Korea, you get those very you know, strong, sometimes violent, aggressive crime thrillers. Um, when it comes to Indian independent cinema, apart from the commercial industries in, in Bollywood and in the south of the country, what do you think is the global identity for Indian independent cinema right now, and, and does, it, does it need a stronger identity, would you say? Yeah. That, that's the, that is the reason that we are at Film Bazaar, I think, and, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a critical question because um, Indian cinema doesn't doesn't seem to have found a consistent voice. Independent cinema hasn't found a consistent voice, and so there will be films that hit and become popular internationally, and then there's not a follow-up film or there's not a series of films, and so it doesn't it doesn't get planted into the to the psyche into the want to see mentality of international audiences. And, and so there will be a period where people say, I'm looking for the next great Indian film. And then if it doesn't come for a while, they forget about it. You know, film is like fashion. So if you're in fashion, uh, you get a little bit of extra space. So there's a period, there were a period when Thai horror films were in fashion, or Jay horror was in fashion, uh, or, or Hong Kong cinema was in fashion. Um, and Indian cinema hasn't, again, has, there, there's so many voices, I think, in Indian cinema. It's hard to find a consistent single voice, and like like Cameron suggesting, I think we need to find a, there's some kind of branding that needs to happen, or some kind of positioning that, that uh, distributors can look at Indian cinema and say we want to have those films, not just that. One. When it's worked in other Asian countries, what's made it work in South Korea, for instance, or in Japan with J-War and the Hong Kong film, that kind of thing, even. Um, there, there are countries like uh, like the Philippines now where there's a certain kind of cinema associated with that country because that's what you see at international film festivals. When people abroad and people that you're working with as a seller um, think of Indian independent cinema, what's the identity or what needs to shape it now? I think it's an interesting dilemma. I mean, on the one hand, you have very well um, not well understood, but you have a well-known image of Indian cinema as Bollywood cinema, and sort of that occupies a huge place in the international awareness of what Indian cinema is. Of course, it doesn't define what Indian cinema is, but for international audiences who don't understand that there are many states in India, there are many languages, there are many other kinds of stories um, that have been told or are waiting to be told, um, they don't see that. And then I think. Again, if you look at Thailand, or if you look at Japan, or you look at these other um, countries in Asia, they really speak with one national language, and one national, one film voice. Um, and India doesn't, because it is a multi-cultural, multi-ethnic, multi-language.
Cambridge Society. Do you think that will the success come then, or the further success when there is uh, kind of a Malayalam cinema that's successful, or Bengali, or Marathi? Is it is it going to be a distinct region and language that will define um, a wave in international unit? Is that likely to happen? I don't. I honestly don't know. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a, a critical question to really try to understand. Um, I think. Also, just like um, you know, a lot of what you'll see in some of these um, other national cinemas, you'll see the emergence of recognizable, consistent celebrity voices, celebrities who, who audiences recognize. Um, like Hong Kong cinema, you can say there was there was Maggie Maggie John, or there was Tony Lung, or, or or there were different people that people would see over and over again, they, they can say, I like that person, I recognize that person. Um, it, it, in Indian cinema, you, you have some names, um, but they're not necessarily well known to a broader to a broader public. Um, of course, now there's a few names that are very well known in China, which is kind of fascinating. But uh, I think that's, that's part of branding. Like, if you look at Korea, there was a government initiative, a Korean government initiative with some of the top entertainment companies and the top marketing companies um, to brand, it's called Brand Korea, and um, to, to kind of develop recognizable faces and names and the look and the style that um, incorporated the music and the cinema and TV show and TV programming and food and fashion and it's been incredibly successful. Interesting, that, that really seems to be at the heart of so much of this is branding, right? We think of it as something that comes from corporations or comes from, you know, international marketing campaigns. But when it comes to art house cinema, the most successful national cinemas, whether it's Iran or, um, you know, Hong Kong or many others, they've had a kind of a brand that's grown up over time as well. Um, Ricchissimo was a brand. Ricchissimo was definitely a brand. So that branding is very important to, to, to just positioning a company, a, 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 a national cinema in the world. Let me ask you a question on that front. So when you were selling films for Fortissimo as a CEO, and you would decide whether or not to pick up a film from India, let's say, uh, because you knew you would have to be taking this film to the AFM, to the Cannes market, to the Berlin market, to Toronto, wherever it might be, um, what would make that decision for you? What would make you think, yes, this is a property that I can actually sell internationally? I, I think, in a way, part of what Cameron does on a, on a daily basis and does so well is to run, is to run uh, and curate a major film festival. That was part of the determining factor for us when we looked at films, we, or we looked at stories. We, we had to have a belief in the filmmaker and the, and the film and the story, but we also had to try to understand how we were going to get this film presented. So what would be the platform? Where, we, where could we launch the film? And for Indian cinema, I think major film festivals, Toronto, Cannes, Venice, Berlin, and a few others, those are critical to the positioning and potential success of, of any film, but of, of any national cinema, but in particular, I think, for Indian cinema, which is less well defined. I think every film we took on from India went to a major festival, launched out of a major festival. And when you're sitting down with buyers internationally, and uh, many of you in the room may know how this works, you go to a major festival or market and you're taking meetings all day long and uh, you're essentially showing your wares and they're deciding what they're going to buy from your slate. Um, what was the biggest challenge uh, for you as, as uh, a company that had a distinct brand? But let's say in this context, specifically when it came to Indian cinema, if you had an Indian film and you're trying to sell a distributor from you know, the Middle East or Argentina or Benelux or whatever, this Indian film, what were the, the challenges and, 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 and what actually worked for you? Well, it actually, it, it became, as the years went by, it became tougher and tougher. Tougher, not easier. The tougher, yes, because the 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 take up of what we would call art house cinema or specialty cinema is pre Amazon, pre Netflix. So the traditional territory by territory licensing of, of, of films um, became more complicated as time went on. And you know, in a way.
way it, what you could say is that Indian cinema was kind of late to the game. You know, we, if you go back into the earlier days of, of Fortissimo's existence, we weren't really focused on Indian cinema at that point. It, it hadn't really, for us, it hadn't, we weren't that familiar with it. It hadn't yet made a mark. I think the earliest film I remember us trying to, uh, I mean, we, we were working with um, um, Deepa Mehta and, and, and we worked with Mary Nair, Mary Nair but, but in terms of sort of the art house films that I remember us looking at and we tried to get and we didn't get it, was the first one was Langan. And I think so many classics gifted I can't yeah. Um, but um, sorry, I lost my hand. Well, I'm just wondering, so you're you're presenting the film, an Indian film to a seller, are they thinking, uh, I hope it's not Bollywood or I hope it is Bollywood? Are, are, there, are they are they coming in with cliches or how are you having to sell it? Yeah. So they were, you know, that's that's a very interesting point. So a lot of times Indian cinema was defined by the, the last prior recognized success. So you'd go, you'd, you'd have, we'd have a ship of Theseus or something, and they'd say, hmm, it's not, it's not Slumdog Millionaire. And we'd say, oh, that's not, it was never meant to be Slumdog Millionaire. That's not, you know, it's a question of whether that's really an Indian film. Or it's not Lunchbox. So, you know, bring me the next Lunchbox. You know, that, that. So I think people relate to people in the international marketplace outside of India are relating to films that they, they recognize were successes that have Indian elements. Um, and, um, and, and that's kind of what they're looking for. The other thing that happened to us, for example, is um, we were involved with a wonderful film called Monsoon Shootout that was premiering in Cannes in, um, in, special, in, in official selection midnight in the same year that Lunchbox was showing. So we presented our film, it was great, I think it's a great film. And then Lunchbox also is a very, a very nice film. Um, and uh, we were talking to distributors, and, and those distributors would say, but I already bought an Indian film. <laughs> like, like you can only buy one film from India, you know? They say, I bought Lunchbox, I have to wait and see how it does. Or, or any French films did you buy? Exactly. So that, and, and, is, so like, again, as the market became more difficult and art house cinema changed, I mean, you find distributors buying less and less films, and so they became, they really were only interested in going after the Sherbet. The Sherbet would be cinema that was familiar to their audiences, or, or the bigger films, or had a recognizable name. And films that were more fancy and more artistic, all of a sudden there was a brand new category called It's Too Small. You know, so you, you do great art, you, you pick up these wonderful films, they would go to Cannes, or they'd go to Toronto, they'd go to, to various markets, and then you'd show, you'd, you'd give a pitch, and you'd show wonderful marketing material, and you would say, it's really nice, I wish I could do it, but it's too small. So, I mean, it's not worth the effort, because the effort for a distributor of a small film and a medium-sized film and a big film is, is virtually the same. But, and so they're not going to choose the film that's the most difficult and yields the, the smallest potential return. I want to get to your questions in one moment. The last thing I want to ask you, though, before we do that, Michael, um, you're a member of the American Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Academy's Best Foreign Language uh, Picture Award is highly coveted all over the world. It's a very complicated process. It was spoken about a bit here earlier because it seems unfair that India, as vast as, as it is with so many hundreds and hundreds of films in different languages, gets to record only one film every year to the Academy. Um, and uh, India's not had a lot of success lately. In fact, Lunchbox was probably the, the best uh, prospect it had in many years and it wasn't put forward as India's submission. What is it going to take for India to win the uh, Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think both India and China have a similar problem, which is that the, so, the selection process of the film that's put forward as the national film is fraught with all kind of political input and, and, and pressures. And so it's not necessarily the film that is the, the, the film that be the most appealing to the Academy voters. You know, it's like it's like everything in life. You need to know your audience. So just like you're doing film marketing, um, 
that's part of tomorrow's speed presentation. They say you know your audience, so you need to know who those Academy voters are, you know, what what kind of moves them. And if so, if you're the national film body and you're saying we really want to put our best foot forward that represents our country, but also has a chance to win, that's a different decision than everybody like battling it out in the political arena and then picking a film that maybe has much less of a chance to win than the obvious choice. So, um, sometimes it has to start here before anything will happen in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because once you have, once you pick the film, um, most, uh, most countries hire a market, a specialized marketing company in Los Angeles and they put on screenings and they host the, they host presentations of the film and they try to get people to come and look at it and that's all very, very important, but you have to choose, the best thing to do is choose the right film. That's true. Thank you. Uh, let's take a little bit of time, if we can, to take questions, if you have them, for Michael Werner, while you have the opportunity to have this uh, very wise man in the room. Any questions at all? Yes, there's someone right here. Do we have microphones? Hi, um, I've, I've myself been in film marketing and I was heading the Sony Classics in India and trying to bring foreign films into India uh, screening. So I kind of understand how difficult it is to show an Iranian film or a, a Chinese film in India. But my question to you is, do you think that uh, it's because of the characters that we have, which is not really appealing in the world market, that it's different because we're just different, just like we cannot you know, we don't see other language films as that. Would that be a reason for a lack of market? It's my first question. And after that, I'd also like to know whether Bollywood, the concept of Bollywood, which is, has that really affected the indie cinema from India, which is Indian cinema? So these are the two things I'd like you to throw some light on. I, I mean, I think it's, you know, Bollywood cinema is is a reflection of India, right? It's not like it came from some place that's not here. So that that is very much a part of, of Indian cinema, just like American commercial cinema is very much a part of the American and North American cinema landscape. Um, so you can't eschew it. You can't just say it doesn't exist and it's not part of our our, our world. Um, and I, I like some Bollywood films also. I mean, I think they're you know. They're Fun, they're fun and they're interesting. Um, you don't necessarily go to be educated, but you go to have some fun uh, and be sometimes be amazed. Um, on the other question, um, we always used to, so the, one of the problems is we always, at Fortissimo, we were looking at these films and we were trying to bring these films to other countries. Um, you always had that question from a distributor in Argentina or somewhere that they were, where they would say, Hey, if that film doesn't work in its own country, why, why should it work in Argentina? You know, so if you're making these films in India, and, and um, why, why should that film, if it doesn't work in India, why, why should it work here? Because we're not Indian, and we don't necessarily understand the culture. Um, there, there are a lot of films that go to other countries and, and do work incredibly well. Wong Kar Wai is an example. Wong Kar Wai's films, um, for the longest time, didn't do well in China, for example. They couldn't get a quota. There, there were no distributors. And sometimes they didn't even work that well in Hong Kong. But they worked incredibly well in France and in Canada and, and, and other countries. Um, it's, uh, it's a hard question to answer, to, to be honest. But, but I think if you're a marketing person, that's, that's part of your job, is to figure out how to connect something that doesn't necessarily seem easily connectable and make it and to other people who, who don't really understand it. You know, the, the one thing I might add is, to me, just looking as an outsider, both at, at the Indian industry but also at, at Hong Kong, I think there might be something similar going on between you know, Hong Kong and China and what's happening in India, which is that you have great artists that, that pop up in, in every country making films, people like Wong Kar Wai, 
But if one car was starting out, say, in the last five years, I think they have a much harder time because it would immediately be a gravitational pull towards the massive market in mainland China. I think the same thing happens here, where you know you could have remarkable artists who might make one first feature, it has real artistic vision, and immediately they're tempted by the massive commercial possibilities of Bollywood or the other commercial industries in the South. And I think it's hard for people to maintain their voices, to develop it as Wong Kar Wai did back in the days when he would mostly be in Hong Kong and then outside of the country. He didn't have to worry about mainland China because that wasn't possible then. Right? In fact, if you look at the Hong Kong film industry, most of the leading filmmakers of Hong Kong have essentially migrated to, to Beijing. You know, they have offices there and, and the projects that they're developing really are focused mostly toward, toward mainland China. That's where the market is. That's where the market is. And if you're in the film festival universe, like Cameron is, that makes it really hard to find films that you want that have this artistic quality that, that drives film festivals. It takes time for filmmakers to develop their voices, their vision, sometimes three or four films before they really hit their stride, and if they're immediately off chasing a big box office hit, they're never going to do it. And I've seen that happen so many times. Um, other questions? Is there someone right here? The microphone's on. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, some of the distributors, when you go to a film festival, say this is too small. Uh, I've encountered that problem in India. Uh, we went to Bollywood distributors with the film and they said, you know, it's too small. It's citing the same reason that, you know, the effort to market it would be the same as a big film and the returns would be less. Now, in such cases, would there be anybody from your side or any international distributor, people who understand cinema, which is not Bollywood, would they be interested in setting up something or distributing within India you know, most of you are all taking Indian films and taking it abroad. How about looking at the model in a different way? You know, there are Bollywood distributors are not going to look at these small films, which they themselves say the content is good, but because of the size of the country, because of it being in Hindi, you know, you're competing against a Shah Rukh Khan film. But probably if you like the film, you want to attempt that in India, distribute it in India. Well. I think it's, it's difficult for non-Indians to necessarily understand the, the workings of the marketplace, let alone the language and culture. Just, just apropos to that, if you look at, um, like, Taiwan, it, which speaks Mandarin, is very close, it's only an hour flight away from Hong Kong. And for years, Hong Kong distributors tried to set up distribution companies in Taiwan, because Hong Kong distributors would say, we can distribute our own films in Taiwan, we know how to do it. And, and you know, although ethnically everybody's Chinese, the culture, the language, the mentality was very different. And all those Hong Kong distributors, for the most part, who tried to set up in Taiwan, never succeeded. Every market has idiosyncratic um, aspects that just make it very difficult. So you're right, but probably it's better left to be other distributors from maybe other Indian states who set up national distribution companies or something, rather than foreigners coming and trying to figure it out. From what I understand is it's very hard for, for Indian companies to do, but I, I imagine it'd be that much harder for an outsider to do. But I think there are models internationally. I think what, uh, say, Alamo Drafthouse is doing in the United States, or what NCAP is doing in France, they're distributing and exhibiting films, a mix of archives and commercial films, but they, they always make room for archives films. I think if there could be uh, an Indian chain that was doing something similar across the whole country, I think there would be uh, more than enough films to, to supply it, but it's, it's going to take some work. You know, just, just again, I know China a little bit better than I know India, maybe maybe a lot better. Um, there, there's now some government initiatives in China to try to create an art house circuit. You know, there's 40,000 screens in China, and there's now a government initiative to try to put together a circuit of about 300 screens. That's involving private companies and state-owned companies, and, and um, it, but it's a slow process. Um, but you need to do it because otherwise the audiences don't know where to find those films. You know, they, they, they go to the cinema and they're not there. Or, 
or they're there for one day and they're Nine gone. in the morning on a Tuesday. Yeah, something. exactly. That, that's what happens with digital distribution. All right, other, yes, is someone here? Hi, I'm Ranjit uh, from Elixir Productions. I have a question for Michael. Uh, he just mentioned uh, that uh, in the festival circuit, typically people do ask for it when they're looking at in films with her. Where is my next lunchbox? Uh, so, uh, was was it uh, typically pointing to that? Are these uh, uh, festival circuit films being uh, stereotyped again? Are they just getting into the similar uh, genre as such? No, I think the reality of distribution is that it's, it's a really difficult, arduous business, and, and so. Distributors are trying to find shortcuts. They're trying to find um, the, the path of least resistance. Maybe that's the best way to put it. So if, if a picture like Lunchbox has worked in a number of international territories, and the distributors um, can say, oh, I had, I had success with um, a film like that, then that's, the, in their mind, that's the film they're looking for uh, as the next film. It doesn't take a lot of homework. They don't have to take a lot of risk, even though, of course, every film is a risk. So that that's like a short end. You know, that that's why it's like that. Um, the, the problem is, I think the hits from India are few and far between. So if it was Lunchbox followed by another film, followed by another film, followed by another film, then you start to see a trend, and you start to have people willing to take more chances. But when it's one film, and then there's no other film that breaks through in a lot of markets for one for two or three years, and people kind of say, oh, Indian, Indian cinema is kind of a risky proposition. Let's, let's take the safe bet. Let's look for a French film. Let's, because again, all these territories, there, there are less and less films being distributed in cinemas in most countries. So you know, these specialty films, you know, you're competing, if you're an Indian film or Chinese film or a Romanian film, or you're, you're competing with the kind of independent specialty slot in, in every country. So it's not like there's an unlimited um, number of slots for films. There's actually a de declining number of slots for specialty films. Yes, there's a, uh, two questions here. We'll go here and then... I guess, sorry, just, I guess the point about that is Nobody's speaking on India in particular. It's just sort of the nature of what we'll call specialty or foreign language. Sorry for everybody. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Anshul Tiwari. I'm a filmmaker from Singapore. Um, I have a question to like, either of you. Uh, do you think there are bigger geopolitical forces at play when it comes to choosing a film from a certain part of the world? Like, we all know that Iran, Middle East is, is hot, like everybody talks about it um, because of the political problems there. China is hot for a different reason because it's now in everybody's mind, especially in the West because it's a superpower, next superpower, they keep talking about it this way. Um, Korea, we all know Korean market has been very much a target. There have been some very popular uh, pop icons coming from Korea that have made uh, in the West. So do you think there are forces at play which are not really like directly connected to cinema but yeah, political forces? I think uh, I'll just uh, uh, answer briefly. Um, I think there's a degree of that but I think it's small. Uh, there, for, for us, you know, as a festival and we also run an archive cinema in Toronto, we look at audiences in two different ways. There are people who come to see films for the art of cinema because they like film first, that specific art form. And for them, it doesn't matter where the film is from. There can be remarkable filmmakers coming from Uruguay or whatever the country might be, very small countries. They're looking for the, the, the practice of the art. But some other people, some other audiences, look at film as an interpretive tool. They want to understand the world through film. And they can understand the world through books or through visual art or through music. And film is just one way for them to understand the world. And that, for those people, films, for instance, from the Middle East, are interesting in the last 10 years or so because the Middle East is in the news constantly. Uh, they want to see films from uh, Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, as we saw not long ago with a film nominated uh, called Watch Different Academy Award. 
Um, but I, I don't think that's the majority audience. I think the majority film audience uh, is looking for the art of film and doesn't care where it's coming from. Yeah. I, I, I agree. And I, I think the other thing to say is we're kind of in a period of, of transition between, I don't want to say that cinemas are a legacy business because there's a cinema operator and, and, um, and, and you know, people are building cinemas all over the place. But, but I think audi the way audiences are, are digesting filmed entertainment or film programming is, is beginning to change because it's everywhere in the world, you know, your time is becoming more valuable than your money in a way. When you're a developing society and, and you have more time than money, it's, it's, it's easy to go to the cinema, you don't mind if it takes you a couple of hours on the bus or the subway or whatever. But when, when your time becomes valuable, you know, it's sometimes it's hard and expensive from a time perspective to go to a cinema and then if you end up seeing a film you don't really like once you're in the cinema, you, you feel really like, oh, I've wasted my time. So these new methods of distribution that are coming, I think offer great hope to, to filmmakers and to distributors, but it, we're in this period where it's kind of a period of disequilibrium where we haven't really figured out how it's all going to work and we haven't figured out how sufficient money is going to come back to the production side of things. Um, but I think, I don't think there's like a great extraterrestrial conspiracy to keep people from watching films from various countries and cultures. I, I think it's just kind of a, a matter of access. And, and access is coming, and it's going to take time to get a new delivery. But um, there's hope, you know, I, I still have hope. And as I transition from being for TCMO in the past to being something new, which I don't quite know what it is yet, um, maybe a strategic consultant or something, um, I think these new um, platforms of distribution are going to be incredibly meaningful for all of us, and even and for festivals. Festivals are also in the process of adjusting to to that to, to that to those changes. Absolutely. Last question to right here. This is Hi. Hi. By the way, Michael, I've actually spent a lot of time in your course class, so, um, where you were born. So, oh, we're conceived, sorry. Anyway, I think you're very, very much on point about the branding of Indian cinema, where distributors are concerned, or how they receive films. Uh, what do you think the brand is currently? Is it the exotic India brand? Uh, and how do we transcend that brand? Or are there other sort of Indian cinema brands that you've seen work with distributors and, and, and sales? Uh, in sales? Well, well, there's incredible India, of course, you know, which I think India is an incredible place and we should, we should cherish that. Um, uh, it, it's incredible for the diversity of, 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 that is India. And um, I think, in a way, that, again, that's, that's also, a bit of, it's, it's a dilemma because the diversity is part of the, the great diversity is part of the, marketing challenge, right? Because there is no one singular India. And, and maybe there's no one singular brand. So maybe it needs to come up with a kind of multi, multi-faceted branding approach, but I, I don't know what that is. Do you know what I would say that has worked at festivals, anyhow, at our festival, is the voices of Indian women. Uh, I would say that Rima Das with Village Rock Stars, um, uh, Lipstick Under My Burka, which we didn't show at our festival, but which has played a number of festivals, uh, Confidence and Sharma's uh, recent uh, feature debut, Nandi Das, I know is making a new film. There are many, many Indian women, uh, Angry Indian Goddesses, not a film directed by women, but all about women. When we show those kinds of films, there's a sort of extra charge that the audience uh, seems to really generate because they're, they're fascinated to see the experience of women in this particular context, which they understand is a little bit different uh, than it might be in, in many Western countries. So that seems to be taking off. I think that's kind of, I don't want to say, I don't want to say films directed by women are a niche, but um, there's kind of, I think if you can figure out how to define niche, niches, you know, there, there are audiences for many different niches, right? niche marketing, niche distribution, and, and, and so maybe that's, we have 21 seconds, and so maybe that's, um, maybe that's the approach. Um, again, not one singular brand, but a multitude of brands.
we are going to have to leave it there. So I'll just uh, ask you to please join me in thanking our guests for today, Michael Warner.